what what have you been doing lately? Obviously, it's been a lot of uh, uh, changes that happened f- since you went on Bill Maher and you told Bill Maher <laughs> that, that you were the first person that's like, yeah, who's going to win today? I think who was to your right? She said Joy. Right. Uh, uh, who was? Uh, 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 Joy Ann Reed. Yeah, MSNBC. she was there. And then another fellow with a weird looking shirt that was supporting Marco Rubio and Gutierrez, who was supporting. I want to say he was talking about Jeb Bush, even though he's a Democrat himself. Yeah. And you said, yeah, this is the one. Can you just play this from the beginning? You were the first, right? Yeah, this you is, can just it was play. Days this is after how it he starts. Announced. Watch this. Okay, here we are. And okay. which Republican candidate has the best chance of winning the general election? Of the declared ones right now, Donald Trump. Look at that. Look. You knew it. <laughs> Look. Look. <laughs> So I, I, of all the I told you so, is, does this rank at the highest for you or? It's pretty good. I, I just remember thinking at the time and days afterwards, liberals always think that derisive laughter. Ha, we proved you wrong. Yeah. And I was thinking, well, we don't know what's happened yet. Yeah, yeah you saw that Joy Reid, who's one of the talking heads on MSNBC, oh. probably the most liberal of all the liberals on MSNBC, literally lost her mind. She couldn't even think for a second. Well, she looked at it like she was nuts, yeah. like and, you were crazy. And, and Bill Maher, you've seen him, you know, sort of stay centered, if you want to kind of call You'll it that. You'll notice he doesn't laugh. He right. knows me. Yeah, he, knows. he knows. Exactly. But <laughs> well, you just laugh and you don't wait for facts when you don't care about facts anyway. Right. right. Well, one of the things I respect about Bill Maher is he's famously said, it's okay for you to hate Trump. You can't hate the people that have voted for Trump. Oh, good for him. Okay. I agree Where with Where do that. you stand on that? Well, I'm starting to hate him now. Uh, <laughs> Trump or Bill Maher? Both. The, no, the, pe- for the people yeah. that still support really? him. Well, um, it's funny because I, th- I used to say, I didn't know he had said that, but I used to say that when Trump was president and not building the wall, not deporting illegal aliens and doing, well, it was the presidency of Jared Kushner um, and Paul Ryan. <laughs> he governed exactly like Jeb Bush. I still would write in Trump we trust because he was the first candidate saying the things I wanted a candidate to say. Um, and I keep, I, I mean, I've given it to, to Republicans saying this was the greatest campaign in United States history. Do what's in this book. It's a great book because it describes, mm. sorry, I guess I shouldn't say that, but it describes <laughs> what was so great about about Trump not listening to the political consultants, not giving us the stupid cliches, not bringing his wife up on stage, not talking about Reagan, 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 Reagan. It was, I will build a wall. He was the only one who directly went to policy, trade, wall, no more, more stupid wars. Um, that's what I've been waiting to va- vote for my entire life. Now, if he had come out at 2 a.m., the night he won, and Hillary people are all crying, crying. Yeah. That was so great. I sometimes just watch that over again. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> and like he had said, <laughs> woohoo, we won, and then had a heart attack and died. That would have been the best thing that could have happened to Jesus. this country. <laughs> because he had proved he had done everything good he was ever going to do with that campaign. And Pence would have been afraid to betray his supporters. <laughs> no, Trump, oh, no, no I'm not going to build the wall. We'll move the embassy, though. You guys should be happy with that. So uh, speaking of Bill Maher. So, so you write this book, in Trump, we, in Trump We Trust, right? So you start off, you go on Bill Maher. You say Trump's going to win. Everybody loses their minds. He, uh, there's a book you wrote that I was he, introducing uh, him at rallies before. Yeah. yeah. Oh, Early, you were everywhere. You were he everywhere. He was banned. He was banned from, no, he wasn't banned from Fox. I was banned from Fox for supporting Trump. But sometimes they'd be forced to put me on when they were covering a Trump rally because I'd be speaking before him. <laughs> That's how much I was for him. Yeah, and then you even write this book, In yeah. Trump We Trust, right? So, okay, so you're fully on the camp. This is August 2023, which is what, three months before, you know, uh, 10 weeks before election time that's coming up. And then he wins. And then you're right. And everybody says, she knew something we didn't know. Then, slowly but surely, you're not happy with what he's doing. The comment you just made right now, the best thing could have been he would have had a heart attack, and that was it because that was the highest milestone. He didn't build a wall. He did, you know, Tel Aviv to Jerusalem. He didn't, you know, how about us? How about us? How about us? At what point did you start turning and saying, wait a minute, what happened to all the promises you made? 10% tariff, Mexico, 20 billion, you could have gotten that money, et cetera. At what point did you say, wait a minute, what is going on here? Um, Before he was sworn in, I was getting nervous. (laughs) We all were. But still, you know, you want to be constructive. And so I was gentle, gentle, gentle. I famously, though I told no one, I'm a vault. I can talk to politicians and they never have to worry about I won't even tell my friends um, because this has to be, you know, private. And I used to talk to him a lot. 
um, during the campaign, he hung on my every word. I could, I could text something to Corey, you know, be coming out of his mouth 30 seconds later. Um, but I showed up in Washington. In fact, I had lunch with Michael Isakoff, the um, very good but liberal reporter, Washington Post and Newsweek. And I went straight from lunch to the White House and I never sat down. I just stood right at the edge of the Resolute desk and yelled at him for 15 minutes, saying exactly what you just said. You are not doing what you promised. You got elected on the wall. You're doing nothing on the wall. You're doing nothing on anchor babies. You're doing nothing on trade with Mexico. Remember, it took him like two years to do that, even, even to end that. Um, and I didn't start using the F word first. But once it started, <laughs> oh, it, it, they heard it through. I mean, I don't know who, how the, pre, the press found out, I don't know, like a month later, and it was published, and I thought, it actually could have been anyone in the West Wing because we were yelling at one another so much. Oh, wow. <laughs> this, is, this is how much uh, after? How was, long? I think it was February. Oh, shoot. Or March. So, like, immediate, 17? Yeah. So it did. Okay. So now when he's putting his team together, uh, were you and him directly talking or was it mainly through Corey d d during the election? No. Dur um, oh, after he was elected, I'd. Actually, every once in a while, I'd speak to him directly during the campaign. But it, when he was, you know, standing up giving a speech, yeah. that was when I'd tell him, you're in New Hampshire. Talk about immigration. They're opioids, opioids, huge, huge issue. Um, and then he'd be saying it. Um, and by the way, I don't think I've ever told anyone that before, but screw him. Wow. <laughs> I'll tell the truth now. Um, and then I talked to him a fair bit on the phone, basically for the first year in office. And... You know, the, the way he tries to win you over, I, I, I met with him immediately after the speech where he was bragging about the size of his hands. And I said to him, um, I happened to be in Florida. I drove to Mar-a-Lago. I was waiting for him. It's him, Corey, Hope, come in. And they're eating dinner. Hicks. Uh -huh. And I said, look, I'm the only person losing money trying to put you in the White House. You're going to listen to me. No more bragging about the size of your penis at debates. <laughs> and what he does is he tries to win you over by, you know, charming you and giving you the, oh, you're losing money here. I'm going to give you something worth $200,000, a membership to Mar-a-Lago. <laughs> As if I'd ever set foot unless I am yelling at the president or president to be. Um, <laughs> um, well, in that case, it might come in handy. Yeah. Right, yeah. right, right. Could have. You get right through the front door, no waiting. <laughs> so, oh, sorry. No, okay. <laughs> so that that was quick. So okay. So from you're saying the so the last time you and him actually had a phone call was when was it in seventeen? No, last? no, no. We kept talking. Then he called me and bragged about. Um, he bragged about how even the liberal media, remember when he bombed Syria and it turned out it wasn't chemical weapons? <laughs> oh, man, what happened to no more wars? So, you know, Ivanka cried, kids died. So he starts bombing Syria. And remember, the liberal media loved it. Oh, they love when we bomb foreign countries. Um, and he called me and told me how, oh, can you see all the great press I'm getting? And I said, this, this isn't what you want on, sir. This isn't, it was supposed to be the wall. It was supposed to be our country. Why are you getting us more involved in the Middle East now? Um, and throughout that time, when he was picking his team, he'd, he'd try to, you know, win me over because I didn't like some of his picks. Why are you, they weren't consistent with what he ran on. Um, and I was pretty gentle about it. Um, but he'd always, like, offer me something. Well, I could do something. Oh, you're not on Fox? You know, Rupert calls me four times a day. And I, I distinctly remember I, I said to him, I don't care about Fox. I don't care about my career. Just hire Chris Kobach for Homeland Security. That's all I want you to do. And he didn't. And uh, no. by the way, the wall would have gotten built and we would be done with anchor babies and dreamers mm -hmm. and the rest of it if he had hired Chris Schell. So, Anne, for, uh, 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 this is your world. You've been in it for a while. You've been, you've been relevant for a long time with uh, issues you talk about. When it comes on to picking your team, okay, when you become a president, it's different if you're in the world, right? So, for example, if your name is Bush, you know, uh, Steve, uh, Stephen Schmidt was here last week and he said a very interesting thing about the fact that when he sat down in a meeting with uh, uh, President Bush and Carl Rove and all those guys are there and c uh, President asking and says, who's the best political strategist I in this room? And Stephen looks at uh, the President and says, hey, President, I would say Carl Rove. He says, wrong. It's me. 
This is my entire family. I've been in politics. I've been this. My dad, yeah. grandpa. Papa. So he made a point. Say, I know what's going on. He says, I don't think John Kerry is going to win. It's because he's an asshole. Yeah. <laughs> but at the same time, we have to be thinking about all these things he's saying, right? It's okay. So Bush puts a team together, but he's been in that world. So he kind of knows who to hire, right? You know, if your name is Obama, maybe you don't know everybody because you're only a one-term senator. So the best comparison I can make to Trump would be an Obama because, again, you're not in it, right? Everybody else prior to him, director of CIA, senior, you know, Ronald Reagan, two-time governor, you know, da-da-da-da-da, you can kind of go to. If he gets reelected, okay, because he's right now ahead by 40, 50, 60 points. It will points. never happen. So you're saying it will never happen. Okay. But go back to it when he did. What should he have done with his team, okay, in an ideal situation? Right. Should it be, let me bring somebody from the, you know, mainstream side to see right. what you think about it. Let me bring some people from the political side. But who do you trust when you're in a position like that, that you've never been in that environment? Right. Well, first of all, um, I want to say those words have never been used in combination before. Stephen Schmidt said an interesting thing. <laughs> <laughs> um, you've made a very good argument so for for and I've heard I've heard people make variations of I mean you do it very well better than I've heard before that well he doesn't know this isn't his world he's in real estate um but no I'm sorry he knew who to trust when he was campaigning he knew if I listen to these people, I'm going to be popular. I'm going to get cheers here. I'm going to get votes. Besides me, um, Jessica Vaughn, basically anything Breitbart said. Um, Chris Kobach is the one who was advising him on how you get Mexico to pay for it. You tax remittances. Oh, that was another thing that I yelled at him in the Oval Office about. Um, it's very easy to get Mexico to pay for the wall. Maybe he didn't understand it. Hire Chris Kobach. So, you know, for, for 16 months during the campaign, he knows, if I listen to these 50, 100 people, I'm going to be huge. I'm going to be so popular. Now I'm president. I know I'll hire my son-in-law, a liberal Democrat from New York. So if you like this clip and you want to watch another one, click right here. And if you want to watch the entire podcast, click right here.